Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode 103. In this episode, I interview Tad Hussey. He has been gardening for 17 years and is the owner of Kiss Organics. He has an extensive amount of knowledge when it comes to reusing soil, and that's today's topic. We also get into pH and living soil, organic fertilizers, heavy metals, and microbial inoculants. I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Bovida is sponsoring this episode. I've been using the Bovida 58% and 62% humidity packs for six years now, and they do a fantastic job at ensuring my flowers are at the ideal moisture content. Their humidity packs help maintain a stable environment, protecting against trichome damage, terpene loss, overdrying, and mold. Check out their website at bovidainc.com. That's B O V E D A I N C.com. I'll also have a link in the YouTube description section of this episode. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. They now have supplemental lighting called the Ion Beam. I have the Ion Beam S11 grow light bars, which are 11 inches long and use Samsung LM301H diodes. But they also have the Ion Beam S16, which are 16 inches long and use the same diodes. It comes with a light controller with four light intensity levels and timer settings. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about their supplemental lighting and the discount code MrGrowit15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Tad Hussey. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on. Today we're going to get into reusing soil. So many indoor growers will start off with a bagged soil, use it for one grow, and then they'll either dump it in their backyard or, or dump it into their trash. Little did I know that soil can be reused, right? Grow after grow. But there are some things that you were going to want to do with that soil prior to reusing it. And that's really what we're going to get into in today's episode. I also want to pick your brain on pH and living soil. Hot topic for sure. Organic fertilizers, heavy metals, and microbial inoculants if we have time. But first, what I do with all guests is an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up around plants. My parents owned a uh, nursery landscape company on seven acres in Redmond, Washington. So I've been around plants my entire life. Uh, I wasn't really into it, though, growing up uh, until... After college, I came back from Australia with a master's degree in special education, and I was starting to get a little burnt out on it. And uh, my my parents had sold their nursery and landscape company and started a business uh, selling and manufacturing compost tea brewers. So I got to start learning about soil biology and micro microorganisms in the soil, and that really sparked some of the like the scientist in me and got me back interested in plants and gardening. And then in 2011, we opened a seven-acre farm and feed store with an organic uh, hydro shop, outdoor preschool, edible nursery. Uh, we had chickens, pigs, ducks, goats all running around on the property. It was, uh, it was a really cool experience. Um, we did that f- until 2017 or 2018 uh, when we ended up uh, shutting that down uh, during right before COVID. And now... I have an online business focused around uh, manufacturing living soils, providing soil amendments, and really working with people on uh, how to properly amend and reuse your soil. So you're not just going to the garden center and buying uh, a fertilizer for tomatoes because it has a picture of a tomato on it, but you're actually looking at like what what is what does my soil really need to optimize um, soil fertility for that plant. Awesome. Yeah, I know you from Kiss Organics. You have that super soil. You have a lot of good organic products and uh, you have a lot of knowledge in regards to reusing soil. So I'm glad we get to uh, pick your brain on it today. You also are a fellow podcaster, right? You want to talk a little bit about that one? Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. So uh, I have a podcast. It's called uh, Cannabis Cultivation and Science. And uh, it's uh, it's a high level technical podcast for people who really want to dive into cultivation. Uh, you don't even have to be growing medicinal plants. Um, 
we get a lot of gardeners that tune in too. But if you want to hear, you know, what some of the latest research is, uh, you know, so we've actually had some of the same guests on, like uh, Bryant Mason is a good example of that at Soul Doctor Consulting. If you haven't listened to the podcast that you did with him, uh, I definitely recommend people check it out. Um, and then I just launched a new podcast called uh, Dope History that's just kind of capturing the narratives um, purely educational of, of people in the industry who came before us that really like set the tone and uh, gave up a lot to to get us to where we are now with our with the legal market. So uh, yeah, those are two podcasts that I that I have going right now. I haven't had a chance to tune into the Dope Podcast, but uh, if it's anything like your other podcast, it's probably a must listen. So. Uh... I'll definitely have to spend some time listening to to those episodes there. Thank you. Yeah, it's totally it's totally different. Um, I, I love the guests we have for season one. I just want to mention we got like Tommy Chong, Ed Rosenthal, uh, Keith Strop, uh, a lot of really awesome people for season one. So yeah, please do check it out. All right, let's get into reusing soil. We have a lot of folks that are using synthetic nutrients in their soil, right? So first I want to ask, can you reuse soil that synthetic nutrients were added into during a past growth cycle? If so, how would you go about reusing that soil? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, it's a little bit of a complicated answer. So first off, I want to say I'm an organic guy. So I, I stick to organic inputs. However, I, I'm not... Um, I'm not cultish about it by any means. And so for people who are using chemical nutrients, I think there's a couple things that get misconstrued on the organic side. And the first one is, is that uh, chemical nutrients or synthetic nutrients kill microbes and they ruin your soil. That's just simply not true. Um, if you put out too many and your soluble salt levels get too high, then yes, you can get osmotic shock. That, that makes it difficult for the microorganisms to survive. It can damage the roots. It's, it's why you don't run high EC um, anyway with, uh, with uh, synthetic salts. So uh, low levels of uh, mineral-based nutrients uh, actually are shown to increase microorganism activity um, and have benefits. And if you look at what like um, the giant pumpkin growers are doing, for example, they're doing a combination of organics and synthetics as a way of like maximizing their yield. So while personally I don't use those, uh, those products, I don't by any means just straight out say that they're bad if we're looking at it strictly from a soil fertility perspective. So you can absolutely reuse those soils. Now, the one thing to be aware of when you go to reuse those soils, um, if you have the capacity to do a soil test, that will tell you what sorts of availability you have, where what nutrients you have at sufficiency, and where you may need to uh, re-amend. Um, also, if you did apply high levels, like if you ran a full cycle of just um, synthetic nutrients, chemical nutrients, you may have... Um, soluble salt levels that are above what we want ideally for our next crop, depending on what we're growing next. You know, lettuces, for example, are going to need a lot less nutrients than tomatoes or peppers or corn. So you may want to flush that soil. So if you're not going to test, one easy way to reuse your media, whether it's organic or synthetic, is just to run a fair bit of water through it. Or if it's outside, it's going to, it's probably going to rain depending on where you are in the country. And so a lot of that is going to leach out anyway. Um, there are some environmental concerns about leaching phosphates and nitrates and things into our water supply. So uh, that's something to definitely be cognizant of. But if we're strictly talking about reusing that soil, you absolutely can. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. I actually asked the same question to Jeff Lowenfeld. Shout out to him. He, uh, excellent guest on podcast. I think you might've had him on your podcast in the past as well, but, uh, asked him about reusing soil where synthetic nutrients were used. He's like, add it to your compost pile, let the microbes work it down and uh, eventually work it back into your garden. So that's an, another alternative. But I like what you had mentioned that if somebody's looking to use that soil back to back, they don't have time to put into a compost pile, for example, just flushing the medium. Yeah, Jeff's, Jeff's a good friend of mine. Uh, and he's he's a character too. He's great to have on podcasters. If you can ever hear him speak live, he's he's phenomenal. Um, what One thing I want to add to that is when we're talking about chemical nutrients, it's important to understand the, the pathway to plants when we are adding organic fertilizers versus uh, synthetic fertilizers. So if you're adding uh, chemical fertilizers, you're essentially skipping that microbe pathway. When you, you They don't need to break that down. So um, you could add it to a compost pile. 
Um, I'm going to disagree with Jeff slightly on that in the sense that uh, the microbes don't really need to break it down because it's already in a plant available form. So unless it's leached through the soil, those plants are going to be able to access it. Um, when we apply something like alfalfa meal or fish meal or some sort of organic fertilizer, uh, for the most part, it needs to go through that microbial interaction, what's called the uh, microbial loop, where the, uh, the alfalfa meal gets broken down by the microorganisms, the bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, and then through that prey and predation cycle, it gets converted into an ionic form, which your chemical fertilizer is already in. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. That makes sense. Now, for the folks that are using soil and they are growing organically, right, they only have organic inputs were added to the soil on that previous growth cycle, and they want to reuse that soil for their next growth cycle. How would you go about reusing that soil? Yeah, so this is a little bit tricky because I realize a lot of, a lot of growers can't afford to get their soil tested. It's just not practical to test it every cycle. Um, if we want to make the best data-driven decision, then we have to use a soil test. Um, and those are going to run you about 50 bucks through a company like Bryant and I really like Logan Labs just because those are the, that's where we started. But whatever lab you go with, um, stick with it. Uh, here in Washington State, if you live in King County, you can use the extension service to get a really basic soil test back. Um, so that's an option. Uh, and that's free. I think you get five free lifetime tests. So you may want to check with your local plant extension universities to see what kind of options there are there for testing. Um, but if testing is off the table, then what I like to do is uh, I like to look at the plant and see what sorts of things am, am I able to tell from my last cycle. So did the plant have any deficiencies? Did it have any toxicities that were visually available for me to see? If not, then I'm going to amend, uh, you know, kind of conservatively realizing that every time I harvest a plant, whether that's a tomato, a lettuce plant, a, a medicinal plant, I'm pulling out nutrients from that soil. I'm pulling out uh, organic matter. I'm pulling out biomass. So all of those things in theory need to be replaced because this isn't a closed loop. So, um, I'm going to probably add back in maybe a little bit of compost. I'm going to add in, um, some more nitrogen and, and a little bit more phosphorus, things that may have been, uh, leached out or consumed more rapidly. Potassium is another one that is fairly mobile. So we want to make sure to put those back in, in low levels to at least, maintain sufficiency in that soil. Okay. So pretty straightforward there. Now there are a lot of people that are actually grabbing the native soil in their backyard and doing things to it. Do you recommend that? Like adding in fertilizer, for example, some sort of aeration, inoculating it with microbes. Do you recommend folks do that instead of going out and buying a bagged potting soil from their local nursery, for example? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends. Like, com I mean, just like native soils, compost, potting soils, all those can vary quite a bit in quality. And, um, like I just moved to, uh, Fox Island here in Washington state and we are within like 10 or 15 miles of an area that had an old smelter. And so the amount of heavy metals in our soils is really high. If I lived in a city, for example, where I knew there's been a lot of uh, disturbance, there's been a lot of you know leaching and things that may have come into contact. Like if let's say I'm trying to grow in like a sideway patch or something like our sidewalk area or somewhere that was close to a road, um, I would be a little more cautious to bring that indoors. Now if I had a, a, if I lived on acreage in the woods and I you know that soil was of good quality, then we could talk about um, how to how to amend that or use that in for growing plants. But like here, I would, I won't use my native soil for growing any, anything I plan on consuming any edible crops, uh, just because of the fact that I know our soil is quite high in heavy metals here in, in the area that I'm in. And I just don't think it's safe for, for my family. And we're going to get into heavy metals here in a little bit. That's a topic that isn't talked about enough, in my opinion. So I can't wait to dive into that in a little bit. Okay, so let's say that folks aren't able to use the native soil in their backyard. Either they can't do it, or they simply prefer using a bagged potting mix. What brands do you recommend? Yeah, uh, Lena, let me back up real quick before I answer that too. So when we're talking about evaluating soils or potting soil, which is actually technically soilless media, even what we're calling living soil today is really a soilless media because it doesn't contain actual sand, salt, and clay. Um, what I look for is sort of this 
uh, picture picture like a, a triangle or a tripod, and the the three things that I'm looking at is one the the physical properties of that soil, how well does it drain, what how well does it retain nutrients, what kind of porosity does it have, um, what abil- how compacted is it, what ability does the do the roots have to penetrate deeper into that soil. So, so you have the physical properties of that soil that's really important for healthy plants, gas exchange, water, hydrology, all of that sort of thing. Uh, the next aspect is the biological aspect of this. Now, you can kind of cut that out if we're going straight to synthetic nutrients. But if we're using an organic system, it's that biology that's obviously really important for cycling nutrients and making them into a plant available form. And then the last aspect of, of the fertility is the actual minerals in that soil. You know, the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, all of our major uh, essential plant nutrients. So that's sort of where I start in my head when I'm thinking about uh, using a soil or using a, a potting soil, whatever the media is, is, is really, you know, how do I address or adjust those three things to make sure they're optimal for whatever plant I'm growing? Um, so then when we get into brands of potting soil, uh, that's a little bit of a tricky question because I'm, you know, I formulate and manufacture potting soil for a living. So obviously I'm biased. Um, I do think if you're paying money for soil, you should absolutely ask for a soil test. And, uh, at the very least, they should be able to explain to you, uh, a little bit more about why they formulated the soil the way they did. Like if you were to call my company, I'd be able to tell you, uh, everything about our soil, why we add what we do, what it's good for growing, what it's not good for growing. You know, like I wouldn't grow blueberries in, in most of our soils without adding sulfur to adjust the pH because it, it's too high and that plant's not going to be, it's not going to grow. Got it. And so actually I want to get a little bit deeper into your soil because your Kiss Organics soil, it's uh technically it's a super soil, right? To where you can just plant in it and then it should last the entire growth cycle without any additional inputs to be added in there. Is that right? And if so, can you actually just talk to us a little bit about that soil? Yeah. So <laughs> super soil was actually a term that was, uh, I believe, trademarked by Scott's miracle Grow way back in the 70s. So I had to change my label. Uh, but that was sort of the common term back in the day when people were growing in uh, TGA soil. Um, if, if you've been around the industry for a little while, that's sort of where it all started. Uh, and we were one of the first ones making these you know, super soils. Now people call them living soils. Uh, that's the latest term that's really popular, um, or water-only soils. And the idea is, is that we pack as much fertility, balanced fertility, into the soil at the beginning of the cycle. So really, you're not having to add nutrients or fertilizer. You can just water your plant and get a good, healthy, organic harvest. Um, unfortunately, that too is complicated, because if you try to grow in a three-gallon pot, you're going to get very different results than if you were growing in a 30-gallon pot or in a bed. And I'm sure, you know, you're familiar with this too. Uh, That plant is going to grow. It's going to use up the fertility in a small pot quite quickly. So this idea, this claim of being able to go the full cycle without any other nutrients is really dependent on the amount of nutrients and how long that plant is going to be in the pot. So, you know, for for medicinal plants, a tomato, uh, a seven gallon pot is sort of the, the minimum size I like to see but we have a lot of guys growing in raised beds and we've actually done some, some scientific trials at facilities and discovered that plants grown communally in beds outperform plants grown um, individually in pots. So even if that soil, so for example, if I took a plant and put it in a pot by itself in an isolated container and gave it more soil by volume, let's say 30 gallons. Uh, and then I took a bed, a yard of soil and put, 12 plants in there, the amount of soil per plant is going to be lower in the bed, but that plant in the bed is going to out yield the one in the pot. Um, And we actually have research to back that. I think it's available on our website. People can look at that study um, that we did. And so, um, yes, the idea being that if you, if you plant the plant um, in our soil or in a living soil, that's well-balanced, you can go the whole cycle with just water at the end of the cycle, you're going to harvest your plant. You'll take out the uh, above ground biomass, so the stalk, the leaves, um, and, and take that away, utilize it. And then what we do, whatever root matter comes with it is great. 
Um, but we don't worry about excess root hairs and things like that in the soil. And then um, we've typically done a soil test if you were like a commercial grower at a facility and we would re-amend that soil based off of that soil test that we took two weeks earlier uh, with exactly what that bed needs to get it ready for the next cycle. And then 24 to 36 hours, we're bringing in our next flowering crop and uh, running that for another cycle. And so we're reusing the media. And we have some guys who have been doing this for you know upwards of five to eight years in the same soil. Um, they've never had to replace the media. So uh, we know it works. And they're, they're growing some of the best uh, product here in Washington and some of the other states that we've been, we've been working in. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been reusing my soil for probably like two to three years now. And, awesome. uh, yeah, I, I was one of the ones that believed that you can't reuse soil if you're using synthetics in there. And, uh, luckily I learned <laughs> that you can, and, uh, I switched over to organics as well. And that's, that's what I've been reusing the soil with organic inputs. It's been working out great. There's really no need to go to the nursery every single growth cycle and spend hundreds of dollars on, on bag soil. I've been using build a soil craft blend. It's kind of like a one-parter that you can use throughout the whole grow cycle. And um, I haven't been doing follow-up soil tests. I'm one of the, you know, I'm just a small home grower growing six to 12 plants max. So me sending out soil tests every single grow, it's just, I should. <laughs> yeah. I should yeah. be doing that and, and re really bit balancing and, and buying the individual amendments and, you know, amending that way. But I've just been using that one-parter and it's been working out good for me. So. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. What we find uh, when we are able to soil test, because you know, we do work with a lot of larger facilities, is that over time, we'll start to see things build up. So if, if your uh, you know, particular cultivar is pulling more, say, magnesium, for example, than uh, another cultivar, um, or the amount of magnesium you're adding, over time, you would have a magnesium deficiency or the same thing goes the other direction with nitrogen, you know, and, and the potential for toxicity with too much if the plants. So it's all about how much is the plant pulling out, how much is in the soil and how much are you adding? So it's really hard to get those perfectly. If you don't, if, if you're just trying to do it based off of, um, you know, essentially guessing, but it is, you know, the nice thing about all of this process is that I should, I probably need to mention is what we call living soil has a much greater capacity to buffer things than hydro and other methods. So at the end of the day, even if you're way off, um, the soil is probably going to help with that. And that's why people say like pH doesn't matter, you know, or I, you know, I don't need to test it in living soils is, is because of that buffering capacity. So that's, I, I think that's why you're having the success that you are. And, and that's awesome. Like, I love to hear that. That's great. Let's get deeper into pH. That's uh, that's the next thing up here. You actually did an Instagram video on this, and you had some great information. And there's a lot of misconceptions, particularly pH. Does it matter in living soil or not? What's your take on that? Yeah, it was kind of uh, <laughs> it was honestly kind of shocking to me that this was such a, a controversial topic. And I'll be honest, I started off on that sort of organic soil route, thinking it wasn't that important because I never had to deal with it. I have really good water. Uh, here in the Seattle area um, that doesn't have a lot of mineral content and uh, is fairly neutral. And then my soils that I used were always within a good pH range, but pH absolutely matters. T take 10 seconds, hop on Google and just Google pH availability chart for plants. And it, it's very obvious when you look at that, that there are certain ranges when nutrients are going to be more available. For your plant and heavy metals are going to be less available and so if we can stay within that optimal ph range and for me um, if we're growing medicinal plants in living soil i like to run a little more alkaline so i, I usually target around six eight um, I'll, I'll go as low as six five now if you're in hydro and other things people are down in the fives or low sixes and for me i like to run a little bit more alkaline because that reduces heavy metal uptake um, it doesn't necessarily limit a lot of the nutrient availability and we still get good yields and good results but yes ph absolutely matters um, anyone who's taken a plant botany course uh, and understands how plants uptake nutrients will under will will agree with it. it's one of those things that like soil scientists just 
don't argue about. It's like the earth is round. Yet when we get into the living soil community, uh, that's where things get a little bit, uh, you know, less sure on, on some of these just basic plant physiology questions. So if a grower is growing with organic inputs and their water source comes in at a high pH, let's say seven or even 7.5 or above, would you recommend that they use like some form of pH down, whether it be phosphoric acid or one of the organic methods of lowering the pH to that water prior to doing a soil drench? Or would you just recommend them water it in above 7.0 pH or whatever it is above that? Yeah. So we, and, and we see this, I've seen water tests that are crazy with heavy metals, with, uh, sodium, with high levels of calcium, um, we you need to know where your water is so that you can adjust it to optimal levels again if you water if if your soil is you know let's just say it's at six eight and then you're watering with water that's seven five and it's bringing in high levels of sodium over time you're going to have and sodium's not a, a plant essential nutrient over time you're going to have some um, issues with high soluble salts um, osmotic shock and your plant's just not going to grow as well is the plant going to be okay if you water a few times with seven, three, seven, five water? Yeah, absolutely. You might make it a cycle. You might make it two cycles, but over time you're going to have issues if you're not accounting for that. And if you were to take that same water and you were to pH it down, uh, your plant is going to have to work a lot less. Um, it's not going to work as hard to access those nutrients. And if it's not having to work as hard to access nutrients, it's putting more energy into creating um, flowers creating, you know, creating biomass, all the things that you want a healthy plant to do. So we're just, we're just making it easier on the plant in a lot of ways and and reducing the risk of some of these other, of some of these other imbalances. Understood. Now, a lot of folks are going to say that, you know, when you're pH adjusting it and you uh, do a soil drench, you're killing off the microbes in there because you're using phosphoric acid, for example, are microbes being killed with pH up and pH down solutions? (laughs) You know, I, I hear this a lot. From what I've seen, the research I've seen actually, uh, phosphoric acid feeds microbes um, in low levels, which is what you should be using. If your water is that far off that you're having to use excessively high levels of pH down, then you probably need to be filtering your water using other means. Um, one thing I will say, if you're using phosphoric acid, your pea availability goes through the roof, which means you're probably, if you're leaching your soil, as in getting runoff, you're probably adding phosphates to our water supply, which is not a great thing. Um, we're already at peak phosphorus. Um, phosphates in our water cause algal blooms. They cause huge issues with our water supply. So I don't, I don't recommend using high levels of, of phosphoric acid. If you need to use a little bit to lower your pH, you want to account for that in terms of how you're managing your your other phosphorus sources, you probably need to reduce those quite a bit um, if you're using a lot of phosphoric acid. You can also use sulfuric acid to lower pH, and you can also use citric acid, but they all have pros and cons. Uh, Citric acid would be really your only organic option, but it's not a great buffering tool. So if you were to add citric acid into a reservoir, for example, uh, and, and put it in there and then come back later in the day, your pH probably has gone back up again. Um, so it doesn't have as much of an impact overall on lowering pH. So just something to keep in mind. Oh, and just this morning, uh, I saw some more lab tests. I've seen two lab tests now on pH down products that were causing people to fail in um, certain states uh, for heavy metals, specifically uh, arsenic in this case. So uh, if you are a commercial cultivator, um, check your pH down as another source of of heavy metal contamination. And we're talking like big time brands in the industry. Um, These are not like they're using small uncommon. If I, if I were to say the brand, you'd be like, Oh my gosh, that's a huge multi-million dollar company that's been around forever kind of thing. So probably GH. I'm not, I'm not going to say what the brand is, but do your research. Yeah. All right. All right. Fair enough. I want to get into organic fertilizer blends. You know, they've become more and more popular over recent years due to their ease of use. What are some of the pros and cons to using these organic blends? Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm growing tomatoes outdoors, uh, and I want to go to the store and buy a fertilizer that 
has a picture of a tomato on it, for example, that, that really simplifies the process. And the nice thing about growing outdoors is uh, a lot of those nutrients are going to leach out of the soil in between cycles. So because of rain events, things like that. So I'm, I'm pretty much starting from scratch every year. Um, I'm not going to have excess nitrates in there. I'm not going to have a lot of available phosphates. I'm not going to have really much potassium. So I can, as, as someone who formulates uh, fertilizers and nutrients, I can feel fairly confident what that starting point is for most growers from a, from a fertility, from a chemistry perspective. Um, so it makes it really easy. Now, if you want to dial that in, a soil test is really useful, but if you're not going to use a soil test and you're growing veggies and you want to just add a veggie fertilizer, uh, that's, it's not a bad way to go. You are paying a premium for that product because they've mixed it together for you. You're buying the brand, um, and some are going to be higher quality sources than others, but, um, yeah, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. Now, indoors, where you're not leaching your soil, where you're not getting that same level of runoff, you can get that buildup and, and toxicities or sufficiency challenges over time. Okay. And are there any blends that you recommend to use or recommend not to use when growing medicinal plants? Oh, yeah. That's so tough just because as someone who's in that industry, um, I don't really want to step on anyone's toes. Uh, here, here's what I'll say. If you were buying uh, bottled nutrients, a lot of what you're paying for is water. So there are better options out there. So a couple companies, if you're using chemical nutrients that I personally turn people to is, is Beanstalk uh, Agriculture, which is a lot like... Um, it's like Osmocode, but it's designed for medicinal plants. If you've ever seen those little tiny pebbles that come in your nursery plant at Home Depot, they're just slow release fertilizers. They're, they're chemical fertilizers and they're going to release nutrients slowly over time. Beanstalk makes a product like that, uh, that you can just put in your soil, water your plant. It's going to release the nutrients slowly and it's optimized for medicinal plants. If you're someone who likes to mix your nutrients, you're a chemical grower, um, and you want to do this as affordably as possible, uh, the best company that, that I've seen out there is Jax. Uh, Dr. Carrie Peters is their chemist. They're a family business. They're great people. Um, they, they test regularly for heavy metals and for nutrient quality. I've had her on my podcast uh, once. I'm actually going to interview her again on Friday. Um, they've done a ton of tissue testing uh, and, and lab analysis on their product. Uh, great company if you're going to go chemical nutrients. On the organic side, obviously, I love I love what we're doing at Kiss. I, we we put a lot of time and energy into creating a soil um, and fertilizer. You know, it took me it takes me about two years to formulate a, a soil mix before I'll release it because I really want to do that research and know it's a good product. Um, one thing I will say, especially for people who are growing organically and are worried about heavy metals or in a state where they need to pass for heavy metals. These tests that I'm seeing on social media do not match the test that I'm seeing when we test things independently. Um, so just because someone claims to be transparent online does not mean that their product quality or their product is actually what they say it is. So um, just be careful there and test your products, but I'm not going to name any names um, in that regard. Okay, fair enough. I know there are some people that avoid the blends. They'd rather go the individual amendment route. What are some of your favorite organic amendments to add to the soil? Maybe talk to us about what the amendment is, application rate, when to add, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. Oh, man, that's uh, <laughs> that's a whole podcast in and of itself because there's so <laughs> many amendments. So like if you go on our website on, on kissorganics.com, you can, you can click on any amendment. Let's just say fish meal. So fish meal is a good nitrogen source um, that's going to be fairly available. It's it's the the size of the molecule or the size of the product, whether it's finely ground powder or it's um, prilled or, or a larger pellet, is going to determine how available that plant that product is. So if you want something that's going to break down uh, more, um, break down slowly, then you you want something that has a larger surface area. Sorry, I said that backwards. Smaller surface area. The larger the surface area is in the smaller the mo the particle size, the more available it's going to be. Um, in term but but fish meal is a great great nitrogen source. So if you specifically want to add nitrogen, you can use fish meal. You can go on the website and see the heavy metal test and see the NPK level that tells you how much nitrogen is in that product. Um, 
And, and so then at that point, it really comes down to when I'm looking at these different amendments, it comes down to cost and it comes down to, you know, what am I paying for that nitrogen? Because at the end of the day, the plant doesn't care if it gets its nitrate from a bottled nutrient, from alfalfa meal, from fish meal. Um, nitrate is nitrate. Now, some sources are better than others in the sense of how available they are or um, if they're bringing in other nutrients or, again, I, I know I've said heavy metals a few times on this podcast, if they, if, they're, if they come with heavy metals, those are all things that you can factor into your, your purchase decision. But, yeah, I like to play around too. I, I like to add those individual things kind of like a – you know, kind of like a wizard or a witch trying to like make a potion sort of thing to maximize my, my plant health. Um, but I like to do it around a soil test. So I actually know that what I'm adding is what I, what is needed. Cause I, I do see that where people are like, okay, there's this hype product right now. I see online, everyone's using it. And, um, if that product's main, main product is main thing in it is let's just say phosphorus for example and i've already got phosphorus sufficiency if i add more phosphorus that could be causing problems you know what brian talked about now my iron may be less available or other other nutrients so um, it's important to keep that in mind when you start playing around with all these little individual amendments that they're balanced that they're you know helpful to the plant um yeah i think if I were to if I were to talk about one, it would be calcium and lime. Just we want to talk about individual amendments really quick. So, when it comes to calcium, you have a, you have a few different. Op- I mean, there's a lot of options like fish bone meal. Anything with phosphorus is going to bring in calcium more or less. But if we're talking about just limes, there's a lot of different limes out there, and they're kind of confusing. So, if we're talking about agricultural lime or oyster shell flour, they're primarily calcium carbonate. They're going to raise your pH, and that's important to know too. Um, so if you're low in calcium, you have a low pH, this is when you want to use agricultural lime or oyster shell flour. And you can use those two. I mean, the amount of trace minerals in oyster shell flour is so small. People think they want oyster shell because it's better than ag lime. They're, they're the same thing. They're both mined products. Um, they're close enough that you can use them together, um, whatever's cheaper. And then the other one is dolomite lime. Well, dolomite lime is going to bring in its calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. So we're getting a fairly large load of magnesium that you may or may not want. So I don't like to use dolomite very often. Um, It's not balanced properly for plant health. Um, And if you were to confuse yourself and add dolomite, it's going to raise your pH a lot faster and a lot, and a lot higher than um, uh, calcium carbonate or egg lime. And then the last one is gypsum. So if you're not sure you have a good pH, you think you need calcium, stick with gypsum. The sulfur in the gypsum keeps the, keeps you, um, it buffers the pH. So essentially it's not going to, it's not going to really change your, the pH of your soil. So, um, that's just where knowing a little bit about limes can make a huge difference in what you add, uh, to your soil mix. Definitely some good information there. Now, how about for potassium? Is there like an amendment that you would recommend? I know a lot of people will add in some potassium in flowering, for example, in order to help with with flower production. What organic amendment is good for potassium? Yeah. So, uh, you know, as Bryant mentioned, a lot of people get sufficient potassium from their compost. Not all composts are high in potassium, but quite a few of them are. So that's something definitely to be aware of. Um, I like to keep potassium sulfate on hand. Uh, it's 50% potassium. It's very available potassium and it's, it's cheap, you know, it's a few bucks a pound sort of price point. Um, so it allows you to get a lot of available potassium really quickly. If you see you have a potassium deficiency, or if your plants just are not, um, if you're just not getting that, that denseness in the flower bud that you want, um, mid to end of cycle, or they're used to seeing, it's probably a potassium deficiency. And so that's where you could start adding potassium to see if you get that plant response that you want. So that's something to be aware of. Um, potassium sulfates, uh, you know, not technically, um, considered completely an organic product. However, um, it is approved for use in organic production if you have a potassium deficiency. So, um, it's something I like to use for potassium. Yeah. In fact, I, I would say the, the products I like to have on hand, if I'm a, if I'm a tinkerer and, uh, y- you know, I, I know I'm going to be need to add individual nutrients. I like to have potassium sulfate. I like to have agricultural sulfur and I would say, I'd like to have gypsum on hand. So the, oh, and, uh, magnesium sulfate. So Epsom salt, 
Um, because those are all things that I can use to get calcium, magnesium, and, and potassium really quickly in a very available source at a very affordable price. And then the egg sulfur is a, is a great way to lower your pH in your soil over time used in, in small doses. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like we're just scratching the surface here with these uh, individual amendments and probably could do a whole episode on this in the future. So might have to invite you back sometime in the future to now we're in on that, you know? <laughs> sure. Let's uh, let's get into heavy metals. We talked about that a few times here that we mentioned, but I want to get deeper into them. Uh, they can certainly be a concern. What should we know about heavy metals? You know, how do we test for them and how do we avoid them? Yeah, so heavy metals is, is sort of something that's become relatively important in the industry and relatively new, something that we weren't really talking about. Um, people were sort of indiscriminately using organic amendments and then states started testing for heavy metals and we found that there's certain things are going to be higher in arsenic, cadmium, uh, lead, you know, some of those major ones that are concerns. So uh, first of all, I want to say this. So no one is testing our vegetables right now for heavy metals. And that to me is is much more of an issue than what they are doing in testing in terms of our industry on the medicinal side. Um, so uh, the other day I was out buying, I was at the grocery store buying tomatoes and I was thinking about, it, I was like, do I want to buy that hydroponically grown tomato in California that was grown using chemical nutrients, but probably not a lot of pesticides in a hothouse? Or do I want to buy that certified organic tomato that was grown in Mexico that probably has laxer standards and no one's testing for heavy metals? So while it may have been grown organically, it may be higher in arsenic or lead or, or cadmium than I want um, too. So it, it got me thinking about what, you know, it's a complicated issue. I guess is what I want to say around that. But in terms of how we manage it in soils, um, I want to say, first of all, we're, we're passing in every state. We did just have a fail in, in Massachusetts. And then I just heard back from the grower today that the pH down was their biggest contributor of heavy metals. But every organic soil is going to have some level of heavy metals. Every organic fertilizer is going to have some level of heavy metals. And so it all becomes down to management. Um, if we know how much the plant is taking out. And a lot of medicinal plants are hyper accumulators of these heavy metals. They're really, really good. Like um, hemp is used in remediating uh, a lot of damaged soils because it's so great at pulling out, um, pulling out heavy metals and other, and other uh, toxins out of the soil. So uh, there's a few things we can do. We can pull it, we can pull heavy metals out by planting a crop that's going to essentially accumulate these nutrients and then getting rid of that, that biomass, all that leaf matter, everything like that. Um, also your stems and your leaves are going to have higher levels of heavy metals than your, your bud or flower. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of how you trim your plant for testing. Um, let's see, what are some other things to think about here? So, uh, running a higher pH is going to help with certain heavy metals in them being less available to plants than others. So that, that will work too. But really, um, you need your, the amount that the plants taking out of, out of the soil needs to be less than the regulatory standard, but higher than what you're adding to the soil every cycle. And I know that's a little hard to visualize. Um, but, but you just have to think about your inputs have to be bringing in less heavy metals than the plant is taking out. And as long as you maintain that, you'll continue to pass. Uh, but we're talking about parts per million or in some cases parts per billion. So it is, it is something you have to be aware of. And there's no formula to say, okay, if this soil has 10 PPM of arsenic, then my plant's going to fail for heavy metals because how you water um, if you're using CO2, what your light levels are, you know, what your VPD is, are all going to be factors in terms of how much heavy metals that plant takes up in addition to pH and, and other things. So unfortunately, there's no exact science to this. There's no great way to know, but we can reduce heavy metals by utilizing products that are lower in heavy metals um, and working with you know who makes your fertilizer to know that you, what your product is is going to be safe and like i said there's some there's some products out there right now that i see on the market that um, are very very popular that are higher in heavy metals than people realize based on the independent testing we've done and 
one one good option for people if they want to test themselves. There's a lab called the Delta Urban Soils Lab. Uh, I think they charge like fifteen dollars a sample. It's not going to be as accurate as some of these other methodologies for testing heavy metals, but it, it's an affordable way to get a test of your garden um, without breaking the bank. And they can also test fertilizers too. So I've uh, we've been using them just because of the price point. You know, if I, I just sent in a sample to get certified for a new um, bloom fertilizer that we're going to be releasing, and I think it was like two hundred and fifty dollars to get the heavy metal analysis on it to get a certified analysis that I can then send to the state to register my product properly. So, yeah, it can be expensive too. Is heavy metals more of a concern with some organic amendments than others? For example, a rock phosphate. Is there more likely to have heavy metals in there versus like an alfalfa meal or a kelp meal and so on and so forth? Yes, though there's no there's no hard and fast rule. So in general, uh, rock phosphates, so soft rock phosphate, people have heard of CalFOS, um, Eden makes a rock phosphate. There's a bunch of them. They're all mined products. Anything mined has the potential to have heavy metals in it. And um, so, yes, I, I think in general, really watch rock phosphates. Kelp meal is another one that we see a, a fair bit of variability on. And you mentioned alfalfa meal, and that's a great example here because people think that like all alfalfa meals are going to be the same, but really it's is the soil that that alfalfa meal grow, was grown in high in heavy metals. If it was, then that alfalfa meal is going to be higher in heavy metals. But without testing of that particular source, you're not really going to know. And, and Again, alfalfa meal is a tough one because it may be sourced from a variety of different places under the same brand name every year. So that's where testing kind of becomes more important. So it sounds like whatever source you're going to to buy that alfalfa meal, kelp meal, or whatever, looking for them doing that testing, looking at that report and seeing if they're heavy metals on there. But also it sounds like doing your own individual testing because sometimes those tests aren't going to be accurate to what the testing that you do on your own. So, wow, that's... Uh, kind of crazy to hear. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. It's just something that, that unfortunately is, is more complicated than we want it to be. And, and it's the same too with uh, nutrient levels. So when, when I go online and I see these charts and forums of like NPK levels for various manures, you know, chicken manure, cow manure for various amendments like fish meal or, you know, anything that has NPK, those things are just going to be rough guidelines. Every product is going to be different. And when the state has done testing on even the products, like you go buy tomato fertilizer and it's, let's just say five, 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 when they go to test that, it might end up being five, seven, three, for example. So there's, there's inconsistency across product too. And it's very hard to, to, to know without, again, without testing, um, what you're actually getting. Got it. That makes sense. Let's flip it up. Let's get into microbial inoculants. I want to talk about that a little bit here. You've got your soil added in fertilizer, but you need those microbes in there in order to break down those amendments and turn them into usable nutrients for the plants, right? Yeah. Now, some people are doing the IMO process. They are going into their backyard and getting microorganisms that way. Other people are buying products on the market. What microbial inoculants do you recommend and how often should people be inoculating their medium? Yeah, there's a lot of options out there on the market now, and it's just it's getting more and more, um, more and more crowded with microbial products, and and some of them are really really interesting. Um, I think there's some great microbial inoculants out there. Um, we've been using Mammoth P for a while. Uh, there's another one called Microbial Mass that I'm setting up trials with right now that I know the founder of that I'm I'm excited to see how that product performs, and then. Uh, I was just talking yesterday with a guy who's got a microbial um, organic cloning gel that I'm excited to start playing around with that they did in conjunction with the university to create research on. So there are some good products out there. Um, a lot of the microbes out there are coming out of China and they're just being rebottled and blended. Um, and that can be good or bad. Um, but you may, but but the, the consistency across microbial products is something that's not standardized either. And if you go on the Oregon Department of Ag website, you can see that um, they did some testing and found that the claims on the labels don't match what's actually in the product too. But things to consider looking into or researching: uh, trichoderma is is an interesting one. Um, there's a lot of good bacillus products out there. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think what I would say, whether you're doing an IMO, whether you're doing, uh, you know, you're buying a product is, is do a control in your, in your grow. So maybe you do half your plants or a quarter of your plants and then test it and see, keep all your other variables the same and see if you get a, the plant response that you want. If you don't, then maybe you don't need to be buying that product or maybe your application rate is wrong on it. But, um, that's where I think people get in trouble is they start adding all these different products in, or maybe they got a bunch of samples at a trade show. And then you really have no idea if any of these things are beneficial. If one of them may actually be antagonistic and you're spending money on something that you don't want or don't need necessarily. Um, if you are doing IMO, keep in mind that you do have the potential to be bringing in pathogens into your grow space. So be aware of that risk. Same with same with compost tea, same with anything you're sourcing outside or from compost. Um, but the risk is relatively low and, and it's something that can be managed. So yeah, just, just try it on a few plants and see how it goes. You mentioned several products throughout this episode and some of the products you got to be weary about, right? Because some of them don't work as intended, right? There's marketing there and they sell you on it. How do you evaluate a product for your garden? Cut through the marketing. Yeah, that's, uh, I actually do whole talks on this. Um, it's, that's an interesting question. So the first thing I try and do with any product is I, I, I try and cut through the BS and look at it and say, okay, what are they actually telling me in terms of information? If they start throwing away around words like proprietary or confidential, um, usually that means they're hiding something that the, the product probably is something pretty basic. It's, it's not something necessarily all that novel or innovative. Um, the second thing I look at is what's actually in the product. So what, what, what is on the ingredient list that I, that I can actually see, because if they are guaranteeing, uh, an NPK level, for example, anything that provides NPK has to be listed in, on the ingredient list. And, and if the, the company is not registering their products with states, uh, like as a fertilizer, what they're doing is illegal and there's no oversight and, you know, buyer beware. So uh, that's one thing to consider. And so I can look through that ingredient list and say, okay, well, these are all things I can source myself, or these are, these are, there's something unique here in terms of the way it's, it's put together that I really want to experiment in my garden. And then I'll try it out and see if I get the plant response that I wanted. Um, so that's something you can look at too. But a lot of these products that, that I'm finding on the market are, are, are really just basic things that are overpriced. Like there's a lot of molasses based products on the market right now that are called sweet or bud enhancer or things. And you look at the ingredient list and you're like, okay, really they're just adding some molasses and maybe a little bit of potassium sulfate in there. And I'm paying two to 300 times what I need to for that product. So yeah. And, and just as a general rule, if there's a picture of like a sexy woman on the cover of your bottled nutrient, you're probably overpaying. I just want to throw that out there because there are a few companies like that out there that have been around the industry for a while. Um, so yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you just gotta, you gotta try things out in a controlled setting and then determine if that product is worth spending money on. The one thing I want to add on that is like, uh, so one of the examples I use in my PowerPoint is seaweed extract powder. So you can buy seaweed extract powder. It's going to be like zero, zero 16, for example. Um, or you can buy liquid seaweed. Liquid seaweed is typically reconstituted from seaweed extract powder, only you're paying now for them to do that for you. Or you can add, you know, a quarter to half a teaspoon per gallon of the extract powder yourself and save, you know, hundreds of dollars on, on a product. So that's, that's a good example there where you can, you know, egg sill 16 H is another one, potassium silicate. You can buy all these different silica products, or you can just buy potassium silicate, um, in the form of egg seal, add it to water yourself and save a ton of money. So these are, there are some ways to like get around spending a lot of money on products. There's another thing I feel like we're just scratching the surface on and we could probably go way deeper on if, if we really wanted to, but we are coming up towards the end of the episode here. A couple more things I want to ask you. Uh, number one, is there anything else in regards to raising soil that you think is beneficial for the audience to know? Yeah. If you're, if you're unsure about the quality of your soil, uh, pile it up outside leave it for a few months, let it get rained on, and then uh, bring it back in and reamend it. Like, Or don't bring it back in, sorry. Use it in your garden outside because it may have picked up some pests or pathogens um, pretty much as if it was just a 
brand new soil that didn't have any fertility. That's probably the simplest and easiest solution. Um, at, at the end of the day, all, all media for the most part can be reused. Worst case is you have to leach it, but yeah, that's my, don't throw out your soil. That's probably my, my biggest piece of advice. Got it. All right. Well, let's wrap things up here. Tell us how can the listeners find you? And is there anything upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Yeah, you can find us at kisorganics.com. Uh, we're also on all you know social media, Instagram. I'm going to be working on some more YouTubes. I'm putting together an indoor garden as well as a uh, – I've been getting into houseplants lately, so I'm excited to do some more stuff around houseplants for folks that are, are doing that. And I'm currently outside building my veggie garden so I can shoot some more videos out there too. So we're really big on education. We have a ton of information on our website and uh, on, on the blog section as well as the podcast. I uh, hope folks will will come check it out. And I, you know, I got to send you a nutrient pack so you can try out uh, our mix and see how it does does for you in your soil. Um, we'll have to chat about that after the show. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll definitely have a link to Tad's YouTube channel down in the YouTube description section below for those of you tuning in on YouTube. And if you want to see Tad come back for a part two, maybe we can uh, convince him to come back for a part two. Let us know in the comments section. Put part two in the comments. And I think if we get enough, we might be able to drag him back into another episode. If you enjoyed this episode, click the thumbs up button. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode, and I'd love for you to tune into future episodes. Tab, once again, thanks so much for coming on. This has been insightful. I've learned a lot, and uh, I know my my audience has is going to be learning a lot with this as well. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your platform and what you do for uh, educating people on growing plants. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your positive words. All right, peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.